Throughout history, humanity has erected countless structures, but only a select few have endured the test of time, from ancient temples that have weathered millennia to fortresses that have guarded empires for centuries. These buildings have borne witness to the enduring resilience of architectural design. Join me on a journey through the ages as we uncover the top 15 oldest buildings that are still standing. Starting with number 15, the Tower of Jericho. In the Bible, the Tower of Jericho was supposedly built by humans in a failed attempt to reach God. And while it's impossible to know if the broken tower in question was the attempted reference in the Bible, what is clear is that it is the world's first stone building. Built sometime around 8000 BC in what is now the West Bank, modern researchers believed it was likely used for purposes that were either social or astronomical. However, its true function is still unknown. Number 14. Mehegar for millennia, Mehegar stood at the crossroads between the Indus Valley to the east and the neighboring early civilizations to the west. First discovered in 1974 by the French archaeological mission, the site dates back to 7000 BC. It consists of several mounds that residents lived in, and quite notably, it's home to some of the earliest evidence of agriculture on the planet. Number 13. The Tumulus of Mougon if you fly down to central France, you can find five Neolithic mounds that make up the famed Tumulus of Bougon. Believed to be about 7,000 years old, they were discovered in 1840, and in essence are a set of mounds that were used as burial places for the dead. Many of these are filled with chambers, and each has hundreds of skeletons inside or underneath it. So therefore, while the site is a bit creepy, it still provides an interesting perspective on early human life. Number 12. Temple of Concordia while it may not be Neolithic, the Temple of Concordia earns a spot on this list due to it being widely considered to be the best preserved temple from the ancient world. Located on the island of Sicily, it was completed in about 440 BC and dedicated to Concordia, who was the Roman goddess of harmony. Thanks to its use as a pagan temple up until the late Roman Empire and a Catholic church soon after that, it has been well maintained and as a result it's still in extremely good condition. Number 11. Cairn de Baronnais Known as the Prehistoric Parthenon, the Cairn de Baronnais is a French monument that is shrouded in mystery. While it's not exactly clear what it was used for, what is clear is that the building was important. Built in two stages between 5 and 7,000 years ago, it would have taken a massive amount of effort for builders of the time to construct. And while its use by locals as a quarry up until the 1950s has led to some damage, the Cairn is still a very interesting place to visit. Number 10. La Hougby Located on the British island of Jersey, La Hougby is a site that's seen a variety of uses over the ages. Deriving from the Norse word for mound, La Hougby is one of the most well-preserved passage graves in the world. For reference, passage graves were constructed out of giant stones forming a crawl space through a mound of earth. They are found extensively throughout Europe, but are not usually as well preserved as the Lohugbi Dolmen. Oriented to receive the sun's rays so as to illuminate even the farthest corners of the passage, Lohugbi in particular is home to a total of 20 vase supports, along with scattered remains of at least eight individuals. However, many of the details of the site's Neolithic years are still a mystery, and according to some experts, there's a fair chance that it was not primarily used for burials. Instead, some believe that its primary function was a place to hold ceremonies, However, the reality is, is that we still don't know for certain. Yet what is certain is that over the years, La Hougby took on different uses. That's because the mound is home to two medieval chapels, with one being from the 12th century and the other from the 16th. Over time, these chapels were altered significantly, and all the way up until World War II, La Hougby saw serious use, as during the conflict it was used as a key lookout point and underground command bunker. Best of all, the La Hougby Dolmen can still be visited today, and in my opinion, it's a great example of how old Neolithic architecture can be repurposed for more modern functions. Number 9. Chaturhuyuk for thousands of years, humans have grouped together into cities, and Chaturhuyuk is the oldest one that we've unearthed. Now, it should be made clear that technically speaking, Chaturhuyuk is not quite a city, but a proto-city. That is to say, a settlement that is different from a regular city due to its lack of planning and centralized rule. In the case of Chaturhuyuk, it appears to have been founded around 7500 BC and home to around 10,000 residents. These residents lived among its interconnected system of primitive homes, which consisted of simple mud brick rooms that seemed to have been added on again and again in an unorganized fashion as the community grew. 
I say unorganized because there appears to be no commercial or public buildings. Rather, it seems like each and every building was a home. Why this is still the case is uncertain, and to make things even weirder, the settlement has a strange lack of the types of trash or debris that would be expected to be found in a city. Some historians believe this was because each building was a home, and as a result, the entire complex was simply cleaner than a more typical city, with stores and public spaces would have been. However, this doesn't mean that archaeologists studying the site have been left empty-handed. After all, countless figurines of animals and goddesses were discovered in the complex, while other interesting features such as paintings have also been found. The inhabitants also seem to have a tradition of burying their dead within their homes, as each home has had a large amount of human bones buried underneath it. Best of all, though, if you'd like to see it for yourself, it's free to visit, making it a great stop on a trip through Turkey. Number 8. Ditherington Flax Mill On the surface, Ditherington Flax Mill may seem like a strange inclusion to this list. After all, it would be hard to argue that it's not a modern building, and amongst this video's ancient temples and Neolithic mounds, it seems a bit out of place. However, Ditherington Flax Mill earned a spot thanks to its very unique status as being the first iron-framed building in the world. You see, during the Industrial Revolution, it became clear that wood-framed buildings were a bit of a problem. Prone to catching on fire, they were less than an ideal way to create new factories and workspaces, and this necessitated something new and innovative. That new and innovative thing was, of all places, Ditherington Flax Mill. By using a fireproof combination of cast iron columns and cast iron beams, the flax mill was able to mitigate the risk from the flammable atmosphere often created at these factories. This soon caught the attention of other builders, and it is this very first iron framing at Ditherington that helped influence the design of today's skyscrapers. In any case, it's probably because of this construction that the Ditherington flax mill has been able to survive more or less without incident to this very day. However, this doesn't mean that things have gone entirely smoothly at Ditherington. That's because after being used for flax processing until 1886, and then for malt production until 1987, it was promptly shut down. This led to it being more or less abandoned. Thankfully, in 2005, though, this abandonment came to an end, when it was purchased by the English Heritage Foundation, with support from the Shrewsbury and Atcham Borough Council and Advantage West Midlands. This conglomerate soon began restorations, and in 2022, it was officially reopened as a mixed-use workspace and public exhibition. As such, I think that the Ditherington Flax Mill is a great model of how historic buildings can be given new life after becoming redundant. Moving on to number 7, Horyuji. Wood is a material that doesn't tend to stand the test of time. Horyuji seems to be an exception to this rule, though. That's because while it has had its fair share of repairs, it stood for about 1,400 years. It's considered to be the oldest wooden structure in the world. The Horyuji Temple is located in Japan's Ikaruga City. It's constructed sometime between 552 and 710 AD. Its central area consists of a main hall and a five-story pagoda. The pagoda is the oldest structure at the complex, as the wood reportedly came from a tree cut down in the year 594. Now, this still leaves us with one important question. Why has Horyuji stuck around for so long while many other wooden structures have fallen? Well, the answer seems to lie in its craftsmanship. See, the architects involved had the foresight to use hinoki, also known as cypress wood, during its construction. This wood is known for its resilience and durability, and some experts even say that Horyuji is as strong today as it was when it was first built. It's also worth noting that its relevance has continued to this very day. You see, the temple was officially founded in about 607 AD by a certain Prince Shotoku. A dedicated and devout Buddhist, he made Horyuji central to the spread of his faith throughout the world. And even today, Horyuji is still a stronghold of the Shotoku sect of Buddhism. This cultural heritage is still very visible, as the site is home to about 2,300 pieces of very early Buddhist sculptures, relics, and art, with these including some of Japan's oldest statues of Buddha. To top this off, Horyuji is still also an active monastery. Unsurprisingly, all of this significance led to it being registered as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1993. And it's an easy day trip from the city of Nara, so I say it's worth visiting on your next trip to Japan. Number 6. Monte di Accordi At first glance, seeing a ziggurat on the Italian island of Sardinia may seem like a strange sight. After all, ziggurats are the ancient platform mounds and steppe pyramids that took shape in Mesopotamia around 5000 BC. And for the most part, these mud brick structures can only be found in the Middle East. However, Monte di Accordi reshapes this narrative. 
Discovered thanks to aerial photos back in 1950, it was initially buried under mounds of dirt and overgrowth, and once excavated, what was uncovered was truly incredible. Built nearly 6,000 years ago, it has a platform that is nearly 27 meters by 27 meters, and at its height, it was likely about 5.5 meters tall, and today it looks more like a hill than a bona fide ziggurat, which is fitting since the word Monte de Accordi translates to a mountain of stones in English. Located in the middle of an empty field, it's almost like an airstrip, as it's in essence a long ramp bordered by stones that reach a slight landing. It's also worth noting that unlike the mud brick ziggurats of Mesopotamia, the ziggurat was made using stones, and in all likelihood was probably constructed in two separate stages that were about 300 to 800 years apart. Now this leaves us with an important question. What was this massive monument used for? Well, the second stage of construction may provide us with an answer. You see, around the year 3200 BC, the second stage of building involved the installation of an altar. Excavations have found the residue of sheep, pigs, and cattle on this altar, and in all likelihood it was used for sacrifices. It's also worth noting that numerous tombs were found within the ziggurat, and some even include ancient carvings of bull horns, which were a symbol of status, and whale teeth, which link the somewhat inland site to the sea. If you'd like to visit yourself, it's only about a 20-minute drive from the city of Sassari, making it a cool pit stop on a trip to this famous Italian island. Number 5. The Colosseum While technically not the oldest amphitheater around, its age, grandeur, and very solid state of preservation gives it a well-deserved spot on this list. Built between the years 70 and 80 AD by the Roman Emperor Vespasian, it was meant to be a gift to the Roman people so they could watch gladiator fights and other entertainment. Built right in the heart of Rome for both symbolic and practical reasons, it was made using materials such as wood, limestone, tuff, tiles, cement, and mortar. Rather controversially, it was largely financed by the spoils taken from the Jewish temple after the First Jewish-Roman War of 70 AD, and once completed, it could reportedly seat between 50 and 80,000 spectators. Now, it must be kept in mind that entertainment was a lot gorier in those days. As such, while the events that took place there would be normal in the eyes of ancient Romans, they would be considered to be absolutely disgusting if they happened today. Oftentimes, fights to the death would not just happen between gladiators, but between both them and exotic animals such as rhinoceros, crocodiles, bears, bulls, and elephants. These gladiators were like the sports stars of the ancient world, with some amassing massive fortunes that when converted to 2023 dollars easily surpassed today's greatest athletes. For example, one gladiator named Diocles is believed to have made a modern equivalent of about 13 billion dollars by the time he retired. Yet beyond gladiator fights, the Colosseum would also host a number of other events. For example, it had the potential to be flooded so that mock naval battles could be recreated, as it is believed that it used to have a wide floodable channel down its central axis in order to make this possible. It was also used for non-combative purposes such as theater, as the fact that the Colosseum is an amphitheater makes it the perfect shape for such a performance. However, most interestingly, at times, even natural scenes were recreated within it, as forests filled with animals would sometimes be made so that audiences could catch a glimpse of what terrains across the empire looked like. Regardless, it goes without saying that the Colosseum was the place to be in the ancient world. Number 4. The Nanmadal Ruins since it consists of thousands of islands far away from the world's first civilizations, it makes sense that Oceania was one of the last places on Earth to be inhabited by humans. However, of all the things built there by its earliest settlers, it's the Nanmadal ruins that have stood the test of time. Considered to be the oldest remaining buildings in Oceania, these ruins date back to sometime around 700 AD and are a fascinating remains of a residential complex. Located in Micronesia, the complex consists of a series of artificial islets and buildings in the shallow water next to the eastern shore of the Pompeii Island. The site encloses an area that's approximately one and a half kilometers long by about a half kilometer wide, and in total it contains nearly a hundred artificial islets. These islets, it seems, were used as homes for the ruling elite of the island's Sadalor dynasty. You see, the Sadalor dynasty had successfully united the clans of the islands of Pompeii, and in the process they forced the local chieftains to leave their home villages and move to the city of Nanmadal, so their activities could be more closely observed. These islets were the place where these chiefs were moved to, and while most of them served as residential areas, some served as areas for food preparation, coconut oil production, canoe construction, and even cemetery services. 
In total, it's believed that about a thousand people lived here, with these people consisting of both elites and the commoners that served them. Since Namadal had no fresh water or possibilities to grow food, it all had to be brought in to them from further inland, and all in all, it would have been a strange, yet beautiful place to live. Yet this still may leave you wondering about how this complex actually came together. While local legends suggest that the stones were flown to the location by Nanmadal by the means of black magic, archaeologists instead believe the rocks come from one of several possible quarry sites on the island. Yet exactly how they were transported and constructed to create the city complex is still uncertain. In any case, by around 1450, the Sadalur dynasty fell, and by the time the Europeans showed up in the 1800s, Nanmadal had already been abandoned. However, there is now a small trickle of tourists to the site, and it can still be visited to this very day. Number 3. Gobekli Tepe While it may not look like much, Gobekli Tepe is a massively important building. That's because, by most accounts, this structure is the oldest human-built structure still around today. Gobekli Tepe is located in southeastern Turkey, and it hails from the tail end of the Stone Age. It's believed to be about 11,500 years old. It's absolutely massive in terms of size and scope, and consists of large T-shaped pillars that climb down a mountain face. While not intact today, they were installed and supported by some combination of walls, pedestals, and a roof. And on each pillar there was a monolith. These monoliths had a variety of subjects, including early depictions of humans, dangerous animals such as vultures and jaguars, and sacred symbols. In total, there are a hundred of these monoliths, although only 5% of the site has been excavated, and a lot of work still has to be done. Now, what this structure was for, nobody knows for certain, however, a few theories abound. Broadly speaking, many believe that it had some sort of religious significance. In all likelihood, the rooms of the complex were used for rituals and sacrifices, and by extension, this would make Gobekli Tepe the oldest religious complex known to man. In other words, the potential origin of religion. However, the truly crazy thing about Gobekli Tepe is that it totally turned our understanding of society on its head. You see, up until the site's discovery in 1994, it was more or less assumed that humans during this time period lived in hunter-gatherer societies. Furthermore, there's no real evidence that hunter-gatherers built massive monuments, as their nomadic lifestyle made it an unreasonable endeavor. However, the size and scale of Gobekli Tepe suggests that those who built it were either not hunter-gatherers, or if they were, far more advanced than historians were giving them credit for. Or, as a third alternative, Gobekli Tepe could point to a society that was in transition, not fully nomadic, but not fully agricultural. This would make the site a truly fascinating study in the shift from one dynamic of life to another. To add further mystery to the site, it seems to have been filled with soil and abandoned in 8000 BC, a full 3500 years after its founding. With all that in mind, I send it back to you. What do you think Gobekli Tepe was used for, and who do you think used it? Let us know in the comments down below. Number 2. The Pyramid of Djoser while the Great Pyramid of Giza may be the world's most famous pyramid, it is the relatively unknown Pyramid of Djoser that is far older. Holding the title of being the world's oldest intact pyramid, it was built sometime between 2600 and 2700 BC, and as the name suggests, it was built for the pharaoh Djoser. Coming in at 60 meters in height, it was the tallest building in the world at that time of its construction, and it was believed to have been designed by the talented doctor, high priest, sculptor, and architect Imhotep. He moved away from the traditional flat-roofed tombs of his era, and instead opted to build a six-layer pyramid out of a mind-boggling 328,000 cubic meters of stone and clay. These techniques would later be used to build the famous Pyramids of Giza, making this early model an important historical relic. It's worth noting that in its day, the Pyramid of Djoser would have been far grander than it is today. That's because it was part of a larger 16-hectare complex containing a courtyard, temples, and chapels, with all of this being surrounded by a 9-meter wall. In order to ensure that grave robbers wouldn't get in, a total of 13 fake doors were installed, and in the event that someone wanted to perform a ritual, they could do so on facades that were etched into the pyramids. All of this security and sanctity was necessary because it wasn't just the pharaoh, but also his 11 daughters who were buried inside the complex. In order to get to the burial chamber, one has to cross through a series of winding maze-like tunnels, and while this was likely done to prevent theft, in later years the pyramid was eventually looted. In what we would call a sad twist of fate, these tunnels which were meant to uphold the sanctity of the structure are also likely an unfortunate factor behind the pyramid's deterioration. 
You see, unless more money is pumped into their conservation, there's a very real chance that the five and a half kilometer long series of tunnels could collapse, taking the entire pyramid with it. And while the company has been contracted to restore the pyramid, there have been accusations that they have done the exact opposite, either unintentionally or by neglect, quickening the pyramid's demise. In any case, if you'd like to visit before the whole thing collapses, it is still possible to enter the Pyramid of Djoser at the moment, so I'd suggest booking a ticket before it's too late. Number 1. The Pantheon While the Pantheon may not be as old as some of the Neolithic buildings on this list, it holds the very fascinating record of being the world's oldest building still in regular use. Now, in one sense, it serves as a spectacular shrine, as it's the burial place of Kings Vittorio Emmanuel II and Umberto I of Italy, Umberto's wife, Queen Margherita, and a few major artists such as Raphael, Annabale Caracci, and Taddeo Zuccaro. However, since its inauguration, it's had an important religious use, and ever since its inception, it has continuously had a religious purpose. Considered to be one of the best-preserved ancient Roman buildings in the city, it was first built by the Emperor Hadrian sometime around 126 AD to replace a smaller building that had burnt down a few years earlier. It was originally used as a temple, and in 609 AD it was converted into a Catholic church, and it still functions as a church on Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. Curiously enough, it is this status as a church that it's likely saved it. After all, many historians believe that it's so well preserved precisely because it's constantly been in use, unlike many other Roman buildings that fell into a state of disuse and disrepair once the Roman Empire fell. While the facade of larger granite Corinthian columns is rather imposing, it's the inner dome that steals the show. It's considered to be the largest unreinforced solid concrete dome in the world. It served as an archetype for the construction of most modern domes. Perhaps the coolest thing about it is that it uses different types of concrete throughout. For example, at its thickest point at the bottom, the dome's concrete is mostly travertine, and as it goes up it uses more terracotta. At the highest points, it uses tuffa and pumice, which are both very porous and light. In a rather clever design choice, the very top, which is usually a dome's weakest point and the most vulnerable to collapse, has a circular opening. In other words, there is an intentionally placed hole in the roof. Now, on the surface, that may kind of seem silly. After all, when it rains, the opening allows water to flow into the building. Surely this must be cause of some sort of damage to the building. However, the reality is, is that it helps to prevent damage to the Pantheon structure. Beyond preventing an all-out collapse, all water that goes through the hole is moderated by something known as the chimney effect. When it rains, the warm air inside the Pantheon naturally flows upwards up to the hole or oculus in the roof. This in turn would cause the rain to evaporate before entry, making it so there's far less rain inside the Pantheon than there is outside of it. However, if any rain does get in, the circular hull causes it to fall to the dead center of the building. It's here that a drain whisks away most of the water, and just in case there's any extra, the center of the building is built on a slight slope so any remaining water flows down into additional drains, located a bit farther from the center. So I think you should agree, the Pantheon is a perfect example of the marvels of Roman engineering at work. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you to our channel members. 